Um, my name is Tim Holland, um, I'm at the University of Southampton. Now what I'm going to um, do, I'm, I'm going to talk about argument and human agency. So this is a slightly different perspective from, um, from what, where, where the, the, this set of slides originated. Okay, so, so um, a few years ago, five years ago or so, um, when I was in a different place in Aberdeen, um, Federico and I, Federico was, was primarily doing it, um, but, but I was giving some input into it for, 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 for the preparation of a, um, a tutorial for Hitchcock. And um, I gave him some, some, um, some input and then he passed the slides over to me and I've used it and adapted it and I've passed them back to him and we sort of it, it's sort of a dialogue between us. And others like Neil Orland have, um, have put into the dialogue as well. Um, and we don't all disagree, don't all completely agree about where what where the perception where the, where the perspective ought to be. But from my perspective, um, I like to think about systems where we have not just computational agents, but human agents interacting within um, solving problems. Because I think that's where things um, become far more interesting. Um, so what I, I'm going to um, start off by talking about is some general ideas about human agent teams and how agents, how computational agents interact and support um, individuals and teams um, in terms of solving problems. Um, then I'm going to um, um, go back to argumentation, um, looking, looking at some structured argumentation with some simple examples, um, and, and um, moving towards abstract argumentation, from which I will then look at dialogue. Um, and things like proof dialogues and talk Look at them from a critical stance, not just here in the proof dialogue, but what is it useful for, the, ex what, what the extent to which it's actually going to benefit human agency, and what is missing, um, and what sort of things do we need to look at and think about in order to um, get these sort of computational systems to support human decision making and collaboration. Um, from, the sort of, from the sort of classic abstract argumentation, we're going to then have a look at some extensions or some adaptations of those sorts of frameworks that start to move the, um, uh, the, the rather abstract, abstract argumentation mechanisms more toward the sorts of reasoning and the sorts of interaction that people do, um, but retaining the formal rigour of those models themselves. Um, and, and, and then also think about exactly what's needed um, with some, on the basis of some work that I've done more recently with Doug Walton, looking at human dialogue from a philosophical perspective and how that fits in in terms of, in terms of the sorts of models that we can build to capture those sorts of interactions. Um, so, so looking at sort of the, the dialogical side of things is the first thing. Um, and then I'm going to have a look at arguments of human reasoning. And there are some, there are a few studies that I'm going to point to where people have actually sat down with, um, with, with, with humans and tried to understand exactly how they use argument in dialogue or use argument in reasoning or use concepts like extensions or probabilistic structures or whatever in terms of their reasoning. Uh, because if we're going to build computational systems, we need to sort of have some mechanism of, of either that they're able to model a human um, or they're able to emulate human decision-making in order to um, support their activity. So where all this is going to is is a sort of a long-term thing that I've been working on primarily with Alice Toniolo, who's now at St Andrews University, um, with, with me in Aberdeen, um, Federico Ceruti 
Cardiff now, and near Orange, who's the only one that's left in that city. Um, so, so if you're interested in ways in which we can build computational systems to support reasoning and collaboration, where humans are doing a lot of the reasoning, and their, 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 the, the work that they're doing is enhanced by collaboration. Uh, and this is sort of instantiated in this um, CI spaces tool, which you're going to play with tomorrow, um, because we've now made it available, not publicly, but just to you, um, on, on the cloud service. Um, and it's not everything, it's not doing everything. In fact, it doesn't support collaboration particularly well, so we removed that bit um, for, for this particular um, workshop. But, um, uh, but there is the support for reasoning in there, which seems to work really well. So that's sort of where I'm going in terms of the, the trajectory of, the, um, of these three hours. And, I, and, and not only are we going to do some exercises tomorrow, we're going to do a little exercise now, um, soon, um, just to break things up, because you don't want to sit there listening to me rabbiting all the time. So let's start off with um, human agencies. And, um, and also, let's, let's sort of start with a simple interactive delegation of tasks between myself and some sort of machine. So suppose I don't have one, but suppose I have some smart speaker thing, which um, well, I do have on my phone, but only my children use it. Um, so I'm asking Siri, because uh, I want to go to Warsaw, I want an inexpensive flight, and I want to depart on Wednesday because my unstated assumption is I want to arrive on Wednesday as well. Okay, so, so I'm delegating this task. Um, and Siri comes back and says this, remember I live in Southampton here, which is on the south coast of England. Um, even if I was still in Aberdeen, this still wouldn't work. So Siri has found an itinerary in Park Manchester, um, in the middle of the country. Um, and at half past six in the morning on Wednesday, which is going to be difficult to get to from pretty much either of those two places at the top of the country or the bottom of the country. Um, and I'm going to go to Athens and then hang around in Athens for a while and then depart there for, uh, for Warsaw. And it's the cheapest, it's definitely the cheapest. So I've inexpensive implies cheapest, so that's essentially the criteria that's been made. And it's, so in terms of the request, this agent has satisfied that request. But I haven't stated all my preferences, requirements, etc., where I live or okay. one would hope I'd switched on location services or something like that. So I will say no. Emphatically, I shall say no. Um, but in, in a way, it's once, the point is here, not that it's a bit stupid, but by the time I've specified all my preferences, I might as well have done it myself. And um, yes, this is, I would imagine that something like Siri would be a little bit cleverer nowadays, um, and these are starting to develop, but the fact of, of how do you elicit um, in an efficient way that doesn't interfere with what they're doing. Um, how do you model their, um, those preferences and how they apply to a new situation? Um, how do, um, how do you sort of think about trade-off between priorities? Like when you depart or when you arrive and how long it takes and etc. cost in terms of your time doing nothing, as well as the cost of the flight itself. So we, I mean, this this is a sort of an interaction between a machine and an individual. Um, but so so this is sort of ancient support for individuals, and the focus is on the tasks that the individual wants to do, and the sorts of 
sorts of things that um, you might want a computational agent to do is to do things like that, like scheduling something, like a trip, um, or, or, some, or, or some activity that various different people are going to do. Um, produce an initial schedule, and which maybe needs to be refined by me because I've got other, other information about what the team needs to do. Um, and then check it and confirm it. So it's, it's doing something, but it's not doing anything. It's helping me and, and performing, um, pr providing functionality that is going to speed up the overall activity. So I can now focus on things like team performance and rely on computational functions that, are, that, 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 that work. So that's agents supporting the individual. Um, agents could be team members. So we could have um, agents that are actually doing a task within the team, performing their allotted tasks, but then coordinating um, and sharing appropriate information with other members of the team so that the team as a whole operates effectively. Now, um, in this situation, we also have to have the agent being intelligible to the other members of the team. So it needs to be able to explain what it's doing and, um, and give a, an appropriate rationale for a certain choice that it's made with respect to the information it has. Um, and the agent needs to model of what the team is supposed to do and the inter interdependencies between individuals. We can also think of computational agents supporting the team as a whole. So we can, um, we can look at agents facilitating communication between team members, supporting the allocation of car tasks and the coordination of, of output from these tasks. Um, so, but in order to do this, we need to have some sort of model of teamwork. Um, embodied in the agent so that it can use that to, um, to support the team as a whole. Um, and another task might be to maintain the focus of attention of the team on a particular problem, or to highlight something that the team hasn't necessarily considered. So, a critical question that hasn't been asked. So there's various different roles that a, that a computational agent may play. Um, the challenges are many and varied. Um, one of the big ones is really to understand what the user intends to do, um, which is highlighted by that example of going to get, getting a flight to, to Warsaw. I actually intended to get there at a reasonable time and spend less time in the so, and, and also, I do not want to have to require a human actor to constantly say to the system, oh, by the way, this is my intent. Because quite often people have difficulty expressing that and are quite vague in what they're, in what they're saying, and therefore it's very difficult for the machine to just rely on that. So recognizing the user intent is a really interesting and challenging problem. Um, providing intelligible information that's relevant and focused on the problem is, um, is an absolutely key issue. And also, think, you know, think about anticipating need. Um, is there a question that is going to be asked because um, there is some assumption that's being made by the team that needs to be tested because, that, because the ultimate decision the team is going to make really heavily depends on that assumption. And if that assumption changes, then what the team does will significantly change. So being useful and providing useful support. Okay, and different roles, as I mentioned, requires different levels of sophistication in the, the computational version. So this is all general. We can throw machine learning techniques at these sorts of things. You can, uh, and, and people can do look at using um, thinking of just preference elicitation, they look at using um, multi-armed 
abandon mechanisms for trying to understand exactly what people's, people's preferences are by trying to minimize the number of questions you ask to build an uncertain model of what their preferences are so you can be allocated in an efficient way. Um, so it's not just argumentation, but actually argumentation can play a really critical role in this context. Because when you're looking at human teams, you have non-trivial dialogue. Um, we have uncertainty and we have to reason over uncertainty. Um, one of the things that that um, that uh, the uncertainty is not just any probability or, or, or a belief mass allocation or something like that. Um, one of the big things that we found in working with intelligence analysts is that they were massively frustrated with current tools because current tools will tell them a number associated with a hypothesis or something like that or a piece of information. And, and they said, well, there are there is evidence that it's purely qualitative. And I don't want to say that my belief in this is why. It's just evidence. And I need to take it, it into account. And not stop forcing me to allocate a number to this thing. Or, or even worse, 0.5. You know, it's a fair comment. Um, none of those are actually um, appropriate to the human user and to their decision-making process. And also, uh, you know, we need to produce coherent explanations that can be consumed by people. But don't but go into enough detail, not give all the detail, but don't, don't, and don't give a number. Okay, so we need to have some meaningful, coherent explanation to, um, to human users. So, how can argumentation help? We've got a few tools. Um, so here's the first task, okay? This is today's task. Um, and I use this as a way to, I use this after a bunch of lectures looking at computational social choice, okay, to our master's students. Um, because, so, Computational social choice mechanisms are really efficient. All, that, all you want to do is to get everyone to give their preference over, some, over a bunch of outcomes. Turn the outcomes beforehand. Everyone gets a vote, and you use some, you look at I mean, various different um, mechanisms for resolving that in terms of a, um, some resulting preference relation. Okay? So a bunch of preferences from individuals, and you want to generate a fair overall preference. Um, and so what I want you to do is split into teams of four, which is not going to work. Um, but if you sort of collect together the four, and the next four, and the next four, and in fact we have exactly, if, if you're going to want to split there, I'll give you a number. Um, so you're not allowed to look at each other's Bit of information. So you are participant A in the first one. You'll be, you're C, and you are D. Now, you're not actually allowed to talk to each other, so that's fine. Um, a, um, What you've got to do is to have a look at the information you have um, and come up with a decision about what your preference is over the outcomes that, you, that you're given. And I'm going to be D in your team, okay, or A, I don't know. Stuff at the top is common to everyone. 
Okay, so it says you and your colleagues in the research lab are having lunch together, but none of you have anything to drink. Given your academic salaries and studentships, you agree to jointly decide what to have, buy in bulk for everyone to save money. Okay? Well, that's the your task, and there are three options: beer, wine, and milk. Okay? Um, and then you have got in additional information that will be different between the four of you. Okay? Now what you've got to do is you've got to write down your preference over the three outcomes, beer, wine, and milk. And once you have decided upon that, given the information you've got here, and everyone's decided, you then share it and you come up with a resolution. Okay, so there's no conversation going on beforehand, but you just come up with a, a preference ordering on the basis of the information, and then you, you, we're going to use a um, thing called the board account in order to come up with the outcome. So, have you got a, a resolution? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 We're going to have wine. Wine, okay. Next, we're going to have wine. Any, any reason why you might have a house? We're going to come back to that. <laughs> what, what are you going to have for lunch? You're going to have a tie. You have a tie? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, usually in voting mechanisms when there's a tie, you just resolve it by lexicographic order. So, whichever is first in the alphabet. Milk. Okay. Okay. So it's a tie between milk and wine. All right. <laughs> yes. What would you? What would you have? Milk. Milk. Okay. We have milk as well. I think I biased it a little bit by saying there's a seminar three for the main people, but, um, but wine is an interesting choice. <laughs> and, and, and a tie between milk and wine is an interesting choice because. Um, so actually, before. So. Do, do you have, do, does anyone have any, any views about what um, would be limited in terms of the protocol I gave you and the information I, I gave you? Any sort of thoughts about the limits of that particular mechanism for coordination? Well, there's a, uh, the, my, my card said that there's no milk in the <coughs> So I assume that it's pointless to choose milk as the preference because there's milk. Okay. I couldn't communicate. So it's possible that milk could have been the winner because they voted for one, but everyone else voted for milk. Yeah, so every team had that information, actually, but three of them chose milk. <laughs> <laughs> is there any reason why milk still is an option? They were the only as well. Okay, so participant C. Yes, participant C was the person that bought all the milk in the shop. And they're happy to share. So. <laughs> <laughs> but only participants who knows that, but you went to the shop and you found them all there. Yeah. So does the protocol seem that each option would be the suitable for everyone, but just not in a specific market? So for participant D, mm -hmm. I can drink alcohol. So the other, so there's only one option that really is suitable for me. Yeah, so participant D is taking, he's on medication. So which is, which is, which is interesting now. So they can't have anything but milk. Um, and that would have pretty much, if, if that was, if you were able to communicate that, then maybe you would have said, there isn't, we can't get any milk, there's nothing in the shop. Oh, but I've got loads, so we can have it. Um, did anyone have a coffee machine? Yeah, but that was another option. But we didn't use that. <laughs> but you were restricted again by the options that I gave you right at the start of the interaction. You couldn't have a new one, which is another condition. Not only for these mechanisms, but actually for many argumentation-based protocols. So uh, the other thing is, is, what does a vote of one mean? So one, two, three in terms of the number of the allocation in order count. Um, a vote of one could mean it's my least preferred option. It could mean it's impossible because there's no milk, as far as you know. Um, it might mean that you makes you ill, or it might mean that you get thrown out of the university or get sacked. Okay? So it's not. A vote is, is, has got very little information associated with it. 
Um, so you can't share background information. So um, BMAs B6 and D's on medication. Um, you can't combine knowledge. So C knew about head department edict about alcohol. Okay? And D knew that the head department was visiting. Oh, that's not all stuff. Okay? So the combination of those two things would have caused issues. Um, a knows the shot out of milk, that's only for the people. Um, and you couldn't introduce new options because, well, copy could have worked, all right? If you knew. But of course, the person with the coffee machine also believed that everyone else, most people, took milk in their coffee and there's no milk in their shop. So they, so they, they didn't often, they, unless they had the information that milk was available, potentially, they wouldn't even have thought that suggesting coffee was an option. So there's lots of interactions between the different bits of knowledge. But the question is, what kinds of agent support might be suitable in this sort of situation? <laughs> Um, we'll get to it certainly in terms of if, if, it was, if it was an agent acting as one of these parties, then sharing information may fall to the If it was an agent acting on behalf of the team, possibly sort of encouraging that or you know, supporting dialogue, etc., or combining bits of information and forming an overall. So that's a little bit of the motivation, really, in terms of what, what we want to do um, from, a, from a human agent team perspective. So let's go back to stuff that you know, some of you. Um, let's have a look at thinking about um, structured argumentation and abstract argumentation. Okay, so So let's have a start off with a controversial claim, okay, or question. Does the NMR vaccination cause autism? For those who aren't aware, there was a controversy over a number of years ago uh, of a, a, um, a medical researcher doing some studies on um, people's perception of using the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination, which is a combination vaccine given to, to young children, and the de development of autism in young children. <coughs> so, and, and this is sort of, I mentioned this, but this is where we're sort of going to. Um, this is, this is the, um, the, the first paper that we wrote on the, the CI Spaces stuff, looking at about reasoning with different forms of evidence. Um, particularly in intelligence analysis. Um, and it was an interesting exercise because this chap, Paul Sullivan, is a, a retired Special Forces Colonel, which kept us in, in, in check all the way through. Um, but he tried to sort of ground what we were doing in reality, in real world situations. Um, and with the collaboration with the folks at UCLA, who were not on the intelligence people there. Crowdsourcing, sensing folks, um, and people at, at Um So, and also the other big thing related to this is um, different types of argumentation schemes. Okay, so um, argumentation schemes were, were were mentioned earlier. These are, of course, the um, the book that, that Doug, Chris, and uh, Francisco wrote uh, ten years ago. Um, so an argumentation scheme, let, let's look at this problem, this issue of the MMR vaccine and autism. Um, one relevant argumentation scheme might be the scheme from correlation to cause. Okay? Um, so there's a, there's a positive correlation between two things from our, our data. And the conclusion is that one of them causes the other. Um, which is a very weak inference, an uh, extremely weak inference. But of course, there are absolutely important critical questions that we need to, to pose here. 
So is there really a correlation between them? Okay, is it just not just charts? Do we have enough samples? Um, is it something, you know, is it a correlation we have just found purely by looking at matching different trends over time, etc.? And there is a, there's a website um, that lists a bunch of spurious correlations um, where they've looked at data, so social data in the US, and they found things like um, the trend over a number of years of the consumption of butter, or mar margarine, I think, correlated positively 0.999 or better with divorces in Berry. Um, it, was, it, it was, it was, the, the, the correlation was there, but they had to look at lots and lots of different data sets and the, and the, and the matches between all those different data sets to find that correlation, okay? If you know anything about the statistics, that's probably, that, that, that's likely to happen with men if you've got lots of different variables. So is there really a correlation, okay, um, and also the sort of sample size is the issue, like I mentioned. Is there any reason to think that the correlation is any more than a coincidence? Okay? Um, could there be some third factor? Okay, some, some common cause of these two things which is leading to a correlation. Yeah, and other other kind of questions in my chart. Um, now you want to capture these sorts of things. You need to represent these things to capture the sort of reasoning we're going through. Thinking about the, um, uh, the any evidence that we might have for a correlation between um, between this vaccine and um, autism. So we need to have some sort of. I need to share these things and and, and, um, and collaborate. In, the, in this context. So we need a common language for talking about it, and of course we do have a common language, and we are in interchange format, and okay, this is the original version. In fact, Federico Ceruti is, is, um, has got a short note at Comma this year proposing a change to ARF that actually fixes it. So um, <laughs> there was some some loves it, but, uh, um, but we have now we have a sort of a, a, a language describing these things and marking them up. Um, so various different relations like is a usage, etc., um, to 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 um, relate to give some sort of structural classification context to things like schemes and arguments and um, different types of nodes within an argument graph, um, etc. Um, and certain types of uh, um, critical questions and other things like that. So there's some other concepts that we might have. Um, okay. So let's look at our problem. So we have um, a claim um, stating that it's possible that the MMR vaccine causes autism. Um, or sorry, is associated with. So this is this is the correlation. Okay, um, the, this is the correlation, and through the argument scheme of correlation to cause C to C, um, we we need to then defeasibly infer um, that the MMR <coughs> actually causes it. Um, and <coughs> the correlation. And hence, it was argued within this paper, the cause, is from this. Um, an early report on, on, I think, the Lancet or some, some reputable journal um, looking at um, the um, uh, autism or pervasive development disorder in children and, um, and the link between them. So, what they did was they spoke to 12 people. Okay, so that was their sample size, 12 people, um, who were self-reported on, so, so these are 12 people, children who have autism, I think, 
and they were reported about when their, their perception about the NMR. So they're asking questions about NMR to, ch to parents with children with autism. Is that not directed? But anyway, and it's a small sample size, etc. So, so, so this is the, the data they had. Um, um, it's, not, it's not important to, to read the text, thankfully. Um, so this is the support for this correlation here. This is what they said in their paper, um, that they, they had 8 out of 12 children. Um, it was related to um, uh, the NMR, apparently. So we have this witness evidence. Uh, behavioural symptoms were associated by parents of 12 children that is underpinning the correlation from which we are inferring the cause. Okay? So we're building up this graph in terms of the link between. And <coughs> so there this was rather controversial and surprised quite a few people, and of course concerned many, many parents. Um, so this was led to further studies, one published um, later on in the New England Journal of Medicine, which um, had a look at a large number of children, a large population study, um, 537,000 children for three children in London, a large number of um, and they concluded that there was no association with the age, no association with time since um, date of vaccination or and the development of the disease. It's a completely defined, large population study. So the question was asked, what else should be true? The critical questions that we saw in our, in our cause, um, our correlation of cause um, argument scheme. The question is being asked, there is support to back up that critical question, and here's the end of the subject. So we now have this other, this, this new structure, where we have a, an attack on the, the argument, of, on the, 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 um, the correlation. There is no correlation, they from the science. It, is still accepted that these behavioural symptoms were, were reported by their parents. They were reporting honestly, they weren't lying. Um, but it, it's not sufficient to actually say that there's a true correlation between the two. So how can we capture these sorts of structures? Um, well, we have someone from the draft here, so we know about Aspic, I imagine. Um, Aspic Plus, having worked with uh, Henry, so, and Sanjay and, and others have contributed to the um, uh, development of these. So, here's a bunch of formulae. Yeah, you've probably seen this before. Um, essentially, what we've got is some language, some formal language. And we have a, 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 fu a function called a contrarianist function, which, which says that, um, so if if some sentence is, is in the set of things that are contrary to some other sentence, and it's not the other, true the other way around, then one is the contrary to the other, and if they're both, um, the second um, line there, if they're both in each other's sets of contrary things, then they're mutually contradictory. And we've got strict rules and defeasible rules, and functions that, that map the feasible rules into the, into the language to indicate whether or not they're clickable, and all those nice stuff, okay? Um, and then from all this, this we, can, we can then specify a, a theory, some argumentation theory, is one of these things, this system, um, that talks about the, the, the evaluation function, the contrary function, rules, etc., and a specific knowledge base, that, that contains the stuff that we know about. So, looking at our particular example of labelling them alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, um, 
these are our, our, our sentences, um, our, our arguments within the within the uh, within this, and we have a bunch of rules, feasible rules, and stuff that's in contrary to other things. So delta is in the set of things that are contrary to uh, to heat. Um, and on the basis of some argumentation theory, which is the system plus the knowledge base, um, uh, we can talk about we can talk about things like the the, the rules, which are sort of linked to the rules across um, ones of the premises of some argument, the sub -rule, sub arguments of another argument, and all of the kind of formal stuff, um, and. Um, with all that uh, machinery, we can talk about arguments that undercut others um, in terms of the uh, um, the conclusion of some argument uh, being having a rule that's, that's applicable um, that, that un undermines the uh, sub argument of the, the one that undercuts. Now, given all this, this mechanism, we can, we can then move from a, um, a structured argument system with all these, the, the bits of information and the links between them and the, the influence links and the common problems, etc., to an abstract structure from which we can then compute extensions using sort of cooling stuff. Okay? So, if we've got we, 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 um, we've got this this argumentation system, sort of um, argumentation theory with the system plus the knowledge base, um, we can build an abstract framework um, where the abstract framework is, is just a tuple of a set of arguments and a tax relation. Um, and the set of arguments is the smallest set of finite arguments constructed from that model. And the attack relation is, is the defeat relation on the basis of stuff like undercut um, and divide. So, and I hate slides, I've got lots of formulas. Let's go look, look at the example. So, we have our, what we had before simplified. We've got our, um, our, our um, witness statement, the 12. The 12 um, parents, our correlations, our, our, our supposed correlation, our correlation to cause inference, and our attack on that on the basis of the larger study, um, which is sort of evidence and hypothesis. Right. Um, and from that, we can build an abstract argumentation system, which which builds up these, these different chunks of, of inference here. So, so the, the whole sort of gamma to beta to, to, to alpha at the top there in terms of one of our abstract arguments at okay, this level. Um, the, um, the gamma to beta, um, just sort of inferring, inferring that here, and this, this diffusal um, inference here taking us from um, with, with Okay, so epsilon data down to the wrong way around. Apologies for that. Um, it's me cutting and pasting the wrong things in the wrong place. So clearly, this is going to be epsilon, and that's going to be delta, otherwise, it makes no sense whatsoever. Epsilon and delta are, 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 are just sort of basic information. Okay? So this is our minimum set of arguments on the basis of that structured argumentation. So we can go, we can. We can do that translation in a formal manner, and then from that compute what's in and what's out. So, Dawn famously wrote this paper and seems to be cited for everywhere. Um, so we have an argumentation framework that is that relation, that, that binary relation over the arguments, um, and we have a various different semantics we can at least apply to lots of different things. Um, and it's all about surviving conflicts together. 
Okay? So what's the set of arguments that make sense together? Um, and people like Martin Canada um, and others have looked at the enabling mechanisms and all the different properties of organizations. Um, and this is so this, this is very much a Rico's perspective, thinking about with these, with these, um, uh, these characteristics of, of argumentation semantics, but I think really quite like this way of, of thinking about it. So of course, conflict-free is, is a given. Um, admissibility is also a given. We need to have a set of arguments that defends itself and attack from outside, fight fire with fire. Um, and then other things, like strong admissibility, which means that a defense has to be from, not from yourself, but from some other argument. Okay. Um, reinstatement, if you, if you defend something from within the set, then you have to take it on board. Okay. That's to be part of your, your set. Uh, maximize, you want to have maximal sets, so no extension of the proper subset of another one. And directionality, which is um, arguments that are only affected by ancestors which are necessary for the stable stuff. So let's have a look at our problem. Okay, we're slightly adapted. Um, I'm going to take into account coffee now. Okay, so I'm going to look at um, um, beer as a proxy for both beer and wine, milk and coffee. Um, this is beer over here, F. And beer makes me ill, and the head of department is coming, are both arguments attacking this. Um, and we have milk in my, well, it's slightly adapted milk is in my bag, and the milk in the fridge is sour. So we've got both defending, both these defenders on the attack to coffee or, or milk. So if we consider something like this, we can have a look at various different extensions. So a complete extension is missed. We need admissibility and reinstatement. Um, so there's, a, there's three possibilities here. Um, the grounded extension, which is where we have strong admissibility and maximum complete. Um, well, so it's the maximum complete extension. Um, and there's one of them, as always. Preferred extensions, we have maxim, um, maximum, um, uh, maximum extensions, but we have reinstatement as opposed to strong visibility. Um, and stable, etc. And of course, there are enabling mechanisms that allow you to, to interpret these structures. So we can label an argument as in, if it's attackers are out, out, or if at least one of those attackers is in, and otherwise it's on the side. Um, so in terms of the complete labelings, A, C, E, and G are all in because there's nothing attacking them. Um, H is out because G is attacking it, so there is one argument that, um, that's in and therefore that goes. Similarly, F, there's no, um, it doesn't have a defense on C or E. Um, and, well, we have some uncertainty over, over B and D. Because it's attackers, F and H have both gone away, they're out. Um, all that we've got is them attacking each other. So they're undecided or uncertain in, 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 a, in a way in this, in this context. Um, so in a preferred state, we can, we can then take into account and consider both the alternative, those that, that take into account D in this case, and the one that takes into account D in this case. Now these, um, and, and of course there's a mapping between um, the properties um, all are conflictly admissible, of course, but the, in terms of the combination of admiss uh, um, strong admissibility and reinstatement, maximum um, maximality and directionality, they will give you subtle variations on the semantics. 
and they're okay. Um, but let's look, but we're looking at the NMR example. Our interpretation of this, at the abstract level, is we have, we have an argument here that's attacking these two. There's nothing attacking these two, so it's in, and these two are in as well. For those two are out. So there's a simple interpretation from the abstract level. But then, because we've, had, we've got a reliable mapping from the structured aspect plus stuff into the abstract um, um, model, we can then go back and, and then have a you know, flag up what's accepted, what's not, what's uncertain um, at the advanced at that level. So what this, this is the sort of the, the first point of where I do what I want to get to. What um, the, the idea from an intelligence analysis process is that um, this structuring of evidence on the basis of we just look the, we, we took the MR vaccine example and various different um, interviews or population studies that, that we've done. These are bits of evidence that people are gathering through appropriate mechanisms, and they're just linking them together with defeatable argument structures, um, co um, attacks, uh, contrary statements between the between them, or asked or through the through the, the fact that you have asked a critical question on some of them, um, and we can use classic solving techniques to give us some feedback on this. Um, so we can use these sort of argumentation based, based mechanisms for supporting the human decision making process. But that's down here, which I'll get to tomorrow morning. Um, before that, I want to have a look at Dharma because CI space is, is short for collaborative I know we're not going to use the collaborative bit, but dialogue is a really important thing because the, the analysts work in teams. They don't just work individually looking at different bits of evidence. Even for a you know, we're also doing some work with the um, um, National Crime Agency, and they work in massive teams looking at things like identifying paedophiles and, and those sorts of uh, scary things on the dark web. Um, so, and they're interacting with each other, sharing information um, and merging things together, trying to get to an understanding of what's going on. So we've got a way of representing our things, various different ways, but ways of mapping from one to the other. Um, we, can, we can identify and justify the conclusions. Um, but the question is how and why do people exchange our things? Um, now, this is, a, this, is, this is something, this is a point of possible contention, I don't know, we have to resolve this between Federico and myself. So I'm not concerned, concerned about how computational agents exchange arguments. I'm of the opinion that argumentation is probably a bad way of doing it. Because it's extremely inefficient, um, and it, it just says nothing about things like incentive compatibility. It says nothing about, um, you're ignoring all the sort of really nice game theoretic mechanisms that, that, that have well-known properties and um, are, um, have been applied in, in various different real-world contexts. But actually, what I care about is human teams. As soon as you care about how humans interact and collaborate, the agents have to deal with that dialogue. So we have to be able to model um, the exchange of arguments, um, selection of arguments that might not be actually in a ground extension or something like that as part of the dialogue. But we need to model these sorts of interactions that make sense to people in order for them to solve their problems. Solve their problems. Now, of course, um, Doug and Eric do proposed a straw man typology of dialogue types, um, and everyone seems to have 
particular you know, this is the set of dialogue type. Um, Doug, neither Doug nor Aaron would ever say, uh, ever say that. Um, so this is a bunch of ideas. These are sort of possibly some types. Um, so there's various different... I think the point is, the point that they want to make is that the starting point and the goal dialogue can vary. Okay? So the starting point where we've got persuasion is that there's a disagreement. Um, in inquiry, they were, well, we don't know. We want to find something out. Um, in negotiation, well, there's certainly a disagreement. We want to come to some sharing of resources. In the pers persuasion, I want you to take upon my, upon my thesis. You know, you know, set my thesis as a platform. So the goal is different, starting point is different. And the mechanisms for reasoning, where the reasoning is, reasoning might be during the dialogue, you're actually sort of constructing um, understanding in terms of dialogue, or um, in the in the process. So different types of dialogue are entered into for different reasons. Um, but we need to have some sort of formalization of this. We kind of, I mean, Chris um, Reed talked about some embeddings and some formal mechanisms for embeddings um, in, um, in, in one of the early multi systems conferences in, I think, when Paris won the World Cup the first time. Uh, well, not France won the World Cup the first time in Paris. It was the, the conference of the left ground at the same time. They're looking at embeddings and whatever, the formal mechanisms. Um, and, there, and there's other things in terms of defining a dialogue game in a formal way, and people at, at Dundee have looked at these, these sorts of things as well. Um, but what I want to do is, is bracket what I'm going to talk about next with this practical reasoning dialogue model that uh, this is the Bernie Hitchcock and Parsons um, wrote a, a paper on this a, a while ago. Um, looking at formalizing practical reasoning. Um, and formalizing and looking at it in, I, I think sort of you know, starting with the classic, um, the classic sort of structure of dialogue where we have an opening stage, an argument stage, a closing stage and trying to talk about how practical, um, um, how, how uh, deliberation that operates in this, in this kind of So they're looking at things like um, considering options, recommending options and firms on shifting into persuasion. So if you're considering options or persuading other parties to take it on board, possibly shifting back to some other alternative, um, it, it seeking information about circumstances that which one, which option that we're considering is the best um, in this situation. And eventually we end up with green But there are various different, more formal dialogue games um, where, um, where you're referring to some abstract um, argumentation. Let's have a look at a dialogue game that looks at some rules for commitment. Where do we start? Um, uh, what can be said and how do you combine the different things that can be said? Um, what are the consequences of saying things in terms of commitments that you make in the context of the dialogue? So like commitments is a propositional commitment, a commitment to defend something that you have stated. Another thing like who says who whose turn is it next and when do we finish? Um, so within these games, when you look, looking at dialogical agents, they tend to just be computational agents, which is itself a problem. But we've got some knowledge base about the world, some private knowledge about the world, and we've got some dialogical commitments <coughs> that are being tracked with this commitment store and records who has said what. 
Um, and there are different ways in which we can specify the meaning of, the, of, of each utterance. Um, so if I say I'm asserting something, then I, that goes into my commitment store and I have to defend it being true. I can't say something that contradicts that. Um, so the post condition of an assert is that all agents believe that A desires them to believe, blah, blah, blah. That's good, that's good stuff. Okay. Um, so we can, we can have combination rules as well. So a question may only be played when someone coming in and committed to something, so you can't question something rhetorically. And the games are governed by a protocol within which the discussion takes place, the final return, the legal rules at each time, at each point, um, and um, although it's not defined within the context of the game, the game effectively defines a tree of, of possible moments, as in any, any game. And so the, the goal of the um, participant is to come up with a strategy that is a good strategy in playing this game. So, here's, here's a question. So, the first one is OE or out, or undecided, or what? I think this, so, so the point of this is that it's not very obvious to see um, what is, what the state, the true state is. Of O is given that we believe all these different interactions between the argument, between the, uh, between the argument. This is sort of an abstract framework. So one of the things that um, has been studied quite a bit are proof dialogues. Now um, the idea here is to find is to provide a way that you can answer questions like. Is, is, is O in um, by engaging in a dialogue with the system. So we're exploring the state um, that is defined on the basis of this graph by saying let's start O and consider um, the, um, the implications of accepting O. So you might, if I say O as a proponent, I might have a question to say, well, what about N? If N's in, no can't. And then it's going to be followed through effectively trying to prove whether or not that's in. So if we come up with a contradiction, which is the wrong way, um, then it disproves. Um, so we're not applying semantics to determine extension membership, we're going to ask questions of some structure um, to, um, to find out whether or not things are in or not. Um, so the idea behind these things is that they're, they're natural to you, they're quite similar to the way people reason. Um, they, you're, you're always, gonna, always going to um, um, if you reach a conclusion, it's going to be a bad conclusion. Um, if there is a conclusion to reach, you will always reach it. And we have we need to be efficient and not sort of have um, problematic problems in terms of complexity. Um, most of the time these, these aren't achieved, and particularly uh, later on, sound and complete is a bit, bit of an issue because that requires common knowledge. But um, here's a simple example. So here's a simple proof dialogue where we have a proponent P um, questioning or essentially you know, initiating the conversation by saying, well, I believe that D is in. And the opponent will then start to question based on the basis of, well, is, does that mean that C is out? Tell me, show me that C is out. Um, response to that is that, well, B is in. Okay. If, you're, if your statement B is in, please show me that A is out. 
And the reason that A is out is that B is in, and now I'm going to accept it because I've got nowhere else to go. Okay? Okay. 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 So ultimately, the, the proponent wins the game. Um, we can then explore things like E, so we can get to another argument to explore whether or not this is it. So is E in? Well, so I can claim that E is in, apologies. Um, so the opponent states, well, does that um, tell me, you know, give me an argument for, for D being out? Um, well, an argument for D being out is that C is in. And the opponent will then come back to say, well, okay, sorry, that means that D is out. So we've got, we end up with a contradiction which disproves the, the original piece. Um, so we've got a simple game, a very simple game here. We've got two participants. We've got a rule to start things off. So the proponent states that something's in. Um, after P moves, the players alternate, and each move of P must be an in move. Um, it could be different in, in the first, because it might be proving that something's out or on the side or whatever. Um, every move of O must be an out move which refers to an attack of a previous distance. Okay. So it's pretty much following this example. And things finish when we either have a contradiction or the, the, the opponent can't do anything more. So there's various different properties of these things. So if there's a game for an argument, one might be in the proposed extension to take it out. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm not going to talk about the ground discussion games I've decided. I think, I think um, it's taking too long because I want to get back to my main point. Okay. I'm sure we'll share slides or something like that anyway. So, um, so it's just an alternate, alternate um, mechanism um, that has another, uh, more, more types of moves um, in order to explore the, 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 these sorts of space. Um, right, okay, that's where I want to be. So one of the, um, <coughs> so there are various different proof dialogues for different semantics. So we can use this as a different way um, to explore a, um, a, a, um, a controversial issue with arguments that are different. And we can potentially, you know, from, from a human agent perspective, one of the benefits is, is that you can, the human can explore this question and investigate whether or not a certain thing that they think is accepted is actually accepted by interacting with an agent that is following this protocol. So from a human agent interaction perspective, that might be beneficial because it's more natural than just looking at an algorithm extension. Um, it's incremental, so it's a bit sort of, you know, it requires time in order to do it. The big assumption, particularly for dialogue, is that um, the argument graph is shared. So we've got common knowledge between all the different participants, and all they're doing is they're, they're browsing through this, this graph. Um, and common knowledge is also, and people are looking at this, but it, it, um, <clears throat> it's pretty much necessary for, for this thing to be quite sound. And there may be some sort of small situations in which you can say, well, okay, um, certain, certain patterns in the graph may mean we don't need to do this, but, um, but it's pretty much um, essential that one shows it isn't, anyway. Um, often it's claimed to be more easily understood by non-experts. Um, so, at that, it, in other words, it's, it's easily understood why it can't be. And I, I certainly, my students find it quite, quite a good way of starting to understand what's going on. 
And the point is that it's got limited usefulness for agents supporting human life. Um, because there's common knowledge. And thinking back to the, 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 the exercise we did, we don't have common knowledge, but it's an easy, even a, a really trivial problem, but um, the, the distribution of knowledge and the fact that we need to share things and give, give um, uh, hand over information that might or might not be relevant to the, the task at hand is possible. So what I want to, so I, this is the bracketing around the proof dialogues. Um, so people, Doug Walton, Alice Toniolo and I had a look at the, the practical reasoning dialogue. Also, considering, um, considering the sorts of situations that actually coffee is an option. It's not just beer, wine, and milk. We could have coffee. And we haven't considered that at the start of dialogue. So there might be new options as we're going out, going through the dialogue. And it's just people do not close the dialogue and then restart it with an expanded set of options. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The new options are introduced during the argumentation stage of the time. So we can't have a closed system where the, where the circumstances never change. We need to be able to accommodate new options. So rather than having a completely separated argumentation stage, um, we need to think about um, reflecting on the circumstances we find ourselves in. We can't, we need to take on board other alternatives that, that might be relevant to our problem. So that was, that was um, the change of circumstances issue. So in realistic cases, during the argumentation stage, we need to think about new options as well. But, we need not only to consider that there may be new options, but also have the obligation to share the fact that there are new options with others. So to warn others of changing circumstances. Um, and we might, there might be consequences to failing to, to do this. Um, now, um, this, So, so, so this sort of is, is our, our argument for um, having a more normative way of, of characterising um, dialogues as opposed to specific rigid functions. Um, so here's, here's an example scenario that, that illustrates this. Um, and this is actually from Alice Tonya, that I think she uses. So, um, we have a disaster response scenario, an agent to discussing um, things like repairing the water supply, setting up a field hospital, um, and it's quite a complex planning problem from different, different participants engaged in this. So the local authority wants to stop the water supply. And the reason for that is that there are issues of contamination getting into the water supply which means it's not safe. But the, human, the, 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 um, the humanitarian organisation wants to build a field hospital in the same location which requires a water supply. Um, and these are direct and direct conflicts. There must, something must, be, must um, change. Um, you could delay stopping the water supply, but that in itself might endanger the people in the hospital. So either we need to, we need to shift the time to, to, to let people suffer and build the field hospital later on, or we change the location where there is safe water supply. So these sorts of situations we need to reflect on sharing knowledge about what we're doing and how it interacts with what other people. So these sorts of these sorts of bridge dialogues need to be accounted for if we're going to have agents supporting these these human decision making. So from a speech act perspective, and this, this is very much this is this is some couple of slides that Doug sent me yesterday, but 
try to trim them down. Um, but the point that, that, that's being made here is, um, is that we, we need to think about new circumstances. And we can't just translate persuasion dialogue structures where we have some thesis that's presented and there's burden of proof on you know, who's, who's, um, um, who's what's in and what's out at a particular stage of the dialogue. It's not burden of proof. Indeed, indeed we, 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 we um, argue that burden of proof is not relevant in deliberation dialogue. It's what we do have is burden of, of um, of responding constructively to requests or information or whatever. So existing models such as those of the student of Henry's um, at Utrecht um, are built on persuasion dialogue. Um, and they have exactly the same sort of burden of proof structures. So if someone asks why, they must reply and argue, give an argument, argument for something being case, or retracting the proposal completely. Um, what, um, what we proposed is that there's no burden of proof. We have a weaker burden of responding constructively, but I'm not entirely sure whether it's sufficiently concrete to, uh, to formally specify it. Um, so there's, the, the overall point is that agents that are supporting natural interaction need to understand and exploit models of natural argumentation that people actually make. Um, but we still have very little insight as to how people select arguments in their world. And in the last bit today, I want to, want to relate this to um, a really interesting study that Sarah Krauss did with her, her student, Karen Rosenfeld. Um, so what they wanted to do was to think about how you can predict human argumentative behavior. Um, so what they wanted, to, they wanted to say, well, what are the arguments that people naturally use? Um, and so they, they, they I mean, clearly, this is really quite important if you're trying to build agents to support people interacting. Because predicting what the, either the other party is going to say as part of the dialogue, if you've got some knowledge about what they know, or even if you've got some uncertainty over your model of that their opponent. Or if you're supporting your human, if you're an agent supporting, support, supporting a human engaging in dialogue. Anticipating what they might say next is going to be useful for things like acquiring information that's relevant to what they're going to say next, or saying, or, or simply sort of um, supporting the process whereby the, 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 um, the interaction takes place. So it's potentially useful for interactive agents. And they did three experiments, um, one of which was sort of a, a, um, a study, a discussion, a loose discussion study. The second one was um, where you offer a number of options, three options to someone engaging in a dialogue and they either select them or do something else. Um, and the first experiment they did was to, to explore how people selected arguments. So they did a sort of a um, uh, mechanical turf experiment where they set up a bunch of, of examples where um, such as this. So this, in fact, this is, this is an example from one of the Holton's papers. Um, should we buy a, an SUV? Um, so if you've got two people, two spouses talking to each other about buying a car. Um, and they used six examples taken from different papers by different authors who are um, looking at our um, So. And this is exactly what they gave to the participants in this study. So they said, there's been two, two, two um, utterances so far in this, in this dialogue. 
So spouse one has said, we should buy an, an SUV, it's the right choice for us. Spouse two says, we can't afford an SUV, it's too expensive. And four options are offered, and the participants were asked to say, which option would you choose? Your spouse one, okay? So you're responding to spouse two. So who okay, of, of the people here, this is clearly a small sample, but who would choose option one? Option two, no one. Option three, okay. Option four, okay, one. Right, no one would have went for option two. Um, so, interest rate on car loans would be high. Okay. Um, so, this is, so this is actually from their paper, it would be from Doug's paper, so it's sort of like um, third party um, diagram. So if this is a, an argument by an SUV, too expensive is the, is the second argument by the right? So um, the, these things are supports, so this is a I kind of love the framework. Okay, so support and attack. So buy an SUV, it's safe. That supports the argument to buy an SUV. High taxes support the argument that it's too expensive. Taking out a loan attacks the argument that it's too expensive. Okay, so that loan usually do. High interest attacks the taking out a loan. Um, so was that even between option one and option three? So option one was um, we should take out a loan, which directly attacks the too expensive. And option three um, argues for the safety of the SUV, which supports your original. Um, and that, that's quite interesting. One of the reasons that's interesting that, that Rosenfeld and Krauss um, highlighted was, was that this thing here isn't in any extension. Um, because it's attacked by, by the high interest, the high tax of the SUV. So if you took, take that in isolation, as a model of an encounter where we've got all the information, then this is never going to be an extension, any interpretation. Um, so, I'm, okay, I'll, I'll, this is two more slides, I think. So, option one good car loan deals are available for the bank. Most people, it's most popular, 27%. Right? Um, only 63, only about two thirds of selected an argument in the grounded preferred statement section. And only 8% chose th those justified arguments for all six examples. I thought, whoa, there's something seriously wrong with argumentation here, which is a bit of a meme. But, um, so, but it's, it's really interesting to, to, to look at exactly how people engage in arguments. So they're looking at relevant arguments further away. They looked at arguments close, which were essentially the ones the majority of you chose. Um, and they looked at, at those sorts of issues, and they used machine learning stuff as well. They do make this really strong claim, which is very interesting, and although thinking of the proof dialogues, the proof dialogues are essentially following through a tree in order to explore the question. Um, so maybe they are more relevant than, than, than I thought. Um, but these, is, and this is the last slide for today, today um, these are the strategies they looked at. They looked at um, two machine learning techniques. Um, 
Um, I can't remember what TLR, uh, transfer learning, sorry, it just is in there. So support vector machines, which is natural language processing technique, because it's sort of lots of relationship between things rather than thinking and information. Um, so that they, they, they had an SPM classifier to um, train on past future behavior to predict what you're going to say or what you're going to what you're going to do with your choosing your next move. Um, there was the same thing, but allowing repeated arguments. And one of the reasons they did that is they observed that people repeated themselves. Possibly your argument by repetition, which is a classic fallacy, but people do do that. Um, I'm sure we all know people do that far too much. Um, three closest arguments. So what you chose is the closest argument. So relevance that is indicated. So closest to the last argument that were sorry, that, that's not true. Um, so the closest argument is these two. High taxes, supports too expensive, taking out a loan, a tax too expensive. Okay? So those are the most relevant arguments to the last one before. Um, and then a combination of, um, so it's also the three arguments as far away as possible. Um, uh, two from the predicted one, plus one from relevance, etc. Et and these are the results that they got. So this one here, try, is, is select something from a, an extension. And it performs really, really badly. Um, it's about, it's about as good as random, okay? <laughs> which, is, which is really interesting in terms of it's not a good thing in predicting the, the, the next step, the future behaviour of people in the world. And these are the sorts of studies we need to think about in terms of making the software we build relevant to um, the sorts of problems we are exploring. So, Stop there and think about what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, given I've got a few slides left. Thanks. <laughs>